Next from Springfield, we talked to State Representative Ron Sandak about his impressions of the current budget standoff. This runs about 10 minutes. I'm mindful that real people's lives are in real jeopardy when we have these type of shutdowns. But on the other end of the spectrum, this is not something that's not been seen before. Uh, in 2007, 2009, heck, go back to the 90s, I think there were three years straight, 91, 2, and 3, I think, or 2, 3, and 4, we had these shutdowns. And they can last a matter of days, weeks, or they can get very long and be really problematic. Right now, we, no one's missed a, a paycheck, and people that provide services um, to our most vulnerable, our, our state employees, everyone's been paid. So, so while we have a shutdown and a stalemate, it's really on a theoretical level so far, and it hasn't been felt practically. July 15th, however, is a payday, and state employees should be paid by then, and there's a very real risk that they may not. So that's what we need to be mindful of. There are uh, platitudes galore. Everyone says, I want state employees paid. Um, the governor has said it umpteen times. The comptroller said it. Yes, the, the four leaders have said it, but yesterday we had a court case where the attorney general went in to say the Constitution says we can't pay these people absent an appropriations. And a court in Cook County held that that is the correct interpretation. That will not be the final word on things, but we have lots of things going on at, in different venues uh, here at the State House, the courthouse, um, in the media and otherwise. Hopefully, soon, things will start to coalesce and a path towards reasonableness will be ventured. Now, as we Stand here today, a couple of hours ago, the governor had a press conference. He was saying that none of his reforms have actually been seriously considered and that if the legislature wishes, they could pass a bill to pay the state employees. Your reactions to those comments? Well, I mean, he's right. Um, his term limits, his fair maps, by the way, there's been no vote on term limits or fair maps. I, I think we can all speculate why the speaker and the Senate president wouldn't let votes out on those two initiatives. Um, there have been what I call rounder light light, not just rounder light, but super extra rounder light on workers' compensation and property tax freeze bills. Those were not the governor's initiatives. Everyone that pays attention, and sometimes that's just inside baseball, knows that. So he's right. Um, you know, my friends on the other side of the aisle, the Democrats that controlled the legislature passed a $36 billion what they called spending plan. They stopped using the word budget and called it a spending plan because they didn't attach revenues that will make the spending plan legitimate. So the governor said, look, let's go through my process of trying to restructure Illinois and deal with these uh, agenda, uh, reform agenda items, or Democrats, pass yourself a tax increase to fund the spending plan you gave to me. I don't think that's irrational. It's one or the other. Um, I tend to hope for the former, not the latter, because we've had tax for, you know, increases in the past and all we do is run up more bills, outspend even those uh, exorbitant budgets and continue to dig a deeper hole. I think we can and should reform this state and I think there are reasonable measures on the table that, that can be accomplished. The governor said today that he had a new pension policy uh, plan yeah of course he was in a press conference you can't give out all the details do you have any ideas of what some of the details are on that I, i've seen the bullet points um we have staff at this moment terry that are going through the bill it's 550 pages of you know wonderful prose and yeah, I'm, I'm sure scintillating words um what i'm told is that it incorporates aspects of senate president cullerton's consideration model has some components of Cook County's model. That Let me insert by consideration model, uh, it would be state employees in consideration of you giving up your current pension and maybe taking something else will do something for you? Sort of. What I'm told, and so you may be right, but what I've been told is it ties to, so it would be beyond the, the realm of a collective bargaining agreement and would be incorporated within the collective bargaining arrangements as well for those not covered by um, union contracts, but essentially would say, if you're in tier one, good for you. Um, but you'll, there'll be a salary cap, a pensionable cap on your salary and your benefits, and you will not get a pension beyond the number you're at at some ceiling. If you go to ceiling, if you go to tier two, you can go further and continue to collect pensionable 
credits against your increased further salary down the line. What that really means is, you know, employees that have been around a long time will stay in tier one. It's a better benefit package. Those that are newer to the game, that are still in tier one, would want to drop down because while they may have to work a little longer, can't retire at 55 maybe, maybe 57 or 60, they'll get a higher pensionable cap. In the long run, it'll inure to their benefit. But the idea here is bargain for exchange, a consideration. You're giving up this, but you're getting that. And you know how many people do it, who knows? But that was Senator President Cullerton's model that he thinks is constitutional. It may be. Um, there are other components of this plan. And by the way, here's what's really interesting about this plan, Terry. It would affect almost every pension system in, in the state except for municipal plans. So it's downstate police and fire, it's state workers, it's SIRS, it's Sears, it's the city of Chicago, it's the co county of Cook. So it's massive in its, in, in, in its scope. Locations. Yeah. And the governor mentioned it would s save billions of dollars annually. I, 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 it's got Not to. just for the state government, but right. probably it, it's got to just government. by its sheer scope. Now, what it does to that unfunded pension liability, it probably does nothing, but it just stops the bleeding. It actually has a turricant, turricant and yet we stop the bleeding, and now we're we're getting somewhere. So we'll we'll see. I mean, I'm, I'm I, I got to tell you, it's pretty. I'm pretty optimistic that despite all this nonsense that's happening um, in the media, in, in the the political world, everywhere. He's, he's still cranking out ideas and he's still trying to achieve some level of bipartisanship because he said that he had been in consultation with Cook County President Preckwinkle, Mayor Emanuel, Senate President Cullerton. Um, I don't know how you get more bipartisan than that, but there was one person conspicuously absent from the calculus there and that was the speaker, um, which kind of portends poorly or, and or exasperate, exacerbates the continuing three-dimensional fight we're finding ourselves in. But it, it seems to me that there's still gonna be pressure bear, to bear because everyone knows pension reform has to happen. And not to keep you too much longer, but as we look at this, as we hear in the news, and we're just reporting from the outside, right? We don't, right. we're standing with our face pressed against the glass, so to speak. What are you hearing from the inside? If you talk to members on the Democratic side of the aisle, is, is it as contentious as it seems to where we're just deadlocked and no one's given an inch? Or are you sensing that there's more goodwill than at this moment appears to be? Well, I think a little bit of both. I, I think there's sincere pressure depending on where you are in the state of Illinois, irrespective of your party affiliation. There are instances and there's places in this, in this state where you're getting pounded because you have a lot of state employees in your district or you have um, a larger per capita number of human service providers. Every one of us are getting calls and emails and, and, and lots of legitimate questions. There are levels of pressure depending upon kind of where you are. So I think a lot of us, again, whether you're Democrat or Republican, you're getting hit. Uh, I, there's plenty of goodwill to be found on the House floor and on the Senate floor. And I suspect even in the, you know, the, the meetings amongst the four tops and the governor, there are fundamental differences of opinion, I get it, but there seem to me still to be some easy, low-hanging fruit opportunities that still haven't been achieved. And I think as pressure mounts, and it will, if this deadlock continues, it's just gonna up the ante. I suspect we'll see more theatrics and more political goofiness, but at the same time, it offers an opportunity to finally reconcile and come to a consensus. You know, and lastly, I would point out to people, we are just now kind of reaping the fruits, you might say, of last November's election of Governor Rauner. It's his first budget cycle. And as I look back over the years of the last three or so administrations, I can't think of another governor who is really in the mode of a Governor Rauner. I mean, mm -hmm. he's probably the most conservative governor that we've had in maybe the last 40 years, mm -hmm. uh, and a guy who is probably just less more of a, let's hold the feet to the fire and get this done. And, and maybe because he hadn't held the office before, perhaps uh, less amenable to just giving in for political purposes. Uh, am I reading this right? Or what oh, do you I, think? I think you're reading, I mean, I'm, I'm sensing the very same thing. Look. He's been here six months and he's inherited $111 billion in unfunded pension liabilities, $5 billion in unpaid bills, the highest per capita debt of any state in the country. We lead 
dubious term, in out-migration, so we're losing talented people and businesses. We are in a really bad spot. I think it's caused, um, and it's uh, emblematic of for someone to be an outsider to finally say, enough. I'm going to put an end to this nonsense. And because he's a little bit immune to some of the regular political pressure, I mean, I'm, he's told everyone, I might be a one-termer, I might be a two-termer, but I'm going to do what's right, irrespective of what's short-term popular or what's immediately gratifying, but not going to help the, you know, the long-term path towards fiscal sanity. That makes him a little bit of a wild card for Speaker Madigan and President Cullerton, who are typically pretty good at playing chess while others play, others play checkers. They're pretty good at reading tea leaves and finding points of, okay, that's enough political pressure. He or she will have to bow and bend and we'll get this done. This governor's not doing that. He, and he's taking his case, you know, he's using the bully pulpit. Today being a perfect example of kind of winning a daily media cycle and letting people know he's still working very aggressively and trying to solve the state's problems. All right, Ron Sandek, we'll continue to follow what happens and good luck to you. Thanks, Terry. Thanks.